I would like to call upon stage for this session on emerging inf infections our two experts, both from Hinduja Hospital, uh, the one and only and um, pediatrician par excellence who doesn't need any introduction, Dr. Suhas Prabhu, please come on stage. And uh, along with him, uh, I would also like to invite Dr. Anjali Shetty, also from Hinduja Hospital. Please give them a round of applause. As you all are all aware, Dr. Suhas Prabhu is an infectious diseases specialist and he has done a humongous amount of work in COVID and a lot of our uh, um, rational antibiotic therapy protocols, etc., vaccinations, etc., related to IAP has, have been um, thanks to Sir. And uh, Dr. Anjali is a clinical microbiologist with several uh, publications under her belt. So, um, as you all know, we have less time, so we'll straight away go uh, to... We are doing a session on emerging infections and issues. Ah. So, we know this minuscule monster has literally wreaked havoc in our lives from that one first patient who got infected in uh, Wuhan. Uh, to now, we are still struggling with this. Uh, and this has become the new normal. We have accepted it and we are all here in spite of it. And the year of COVID and its history, right from the first case in Jan uh, 30th, 2020, to the vaccination, to the second wave, which has created uh, history in terms of the lives taken, and COVID has emerged as a killer disease. So our plan for today is to talk about emerging infections and their relevance. Um, what are the issues that are important to us as healthcare professionals? What action needs to be taken in case a suspected case coming from a cluster comes to us? And then we'll have a few cases for discussion. These cases are not to understand how to arrive at a diagnosis, but more to do with the topic for the day and how to deal with such infections. And uh, of course, COVID era and um, uh, its effect on infections. So emerging infections are those that have recently appeared in the population and whose incidence or geographical range is rapidly increasing. Over 30 such have been detected in the last three decades. And 60 of these, 60% of these are zoonotic infections. And India, because of its specific environmental, socioeconomic, demographic factors, we are a poor country, we are more exposed to this. So I'll quickly go through these so-called esoteric names, but soon you realize that uh, you see news where even as recently uh, in, Na in Kanpur, as November 2021, cases have been reported. So Zika virus is some, a virus that is important for us because it resembles so much the dengue infection and the chikungunya infection, and also because mothers affected by Zika are going to have babies that are abnormal. So for purposes of Brevity, I have, uh, you know, quickly moved on to the next virus, the Nipah. We all heard about this one. Again, a lot of uh, shocking news uh, articles coming in the newspaper, first episodes in Kerala. And uh, being a zoonotic infection, we were uh, aware that fruit bats, pigs, etc., spill over to the humans. And it presents as an encephalitic kind of syndrome. Diagnosis is with RT-PCR of the body fluids and antibody by ELASA very high mortality rate and treatment is mainly supportive and what to do for prevention we learned during this small phase where this uh, infection had made itself known then this tongue twister name Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever again we came to know from the news reports and mostly reported in Gujarat in certain uh, families in certain villages where the clusters were especially be uh, because they were um, farming population dealing with animals. And again, this infection is tick-borne, uh, coming with headache and backache and uh, hemorrhagic manifestations, high mortality, pretty much no known treatment, and the last is bird flu. Often we hear so many chicken being culled here and there, and this particular influenza group of viruses is also known in humans and we have had a death reported in as uh, recently as August 2021. So this is an influenza-like illness and also presents can become very, very uh, uh, dangerous with a very high fatality rate and uh, vaccination and uh, basically safety 
keeping yourself safe is important. So now you are in casualty duty one night and Dr. Amruta um, is on casualty duty and she's going to tell you what she has, she would face in such a situation. So we have a case here uh, in the casualty of a 10 year old child who's come with a history of high grade fever for three days, profuse vomiting, abnormal behavior and drowsiness since the past, la since the past few hours. And on a quick physical examination, uh, it is revealed that he has a tachycardia, acidotic breathing, uh, systolic BP of 90, petechial rashes notice on the trunk, and mucosal bleeds in oral cavity. The GCS is 6 to 7. So uh, this child is resuscitated, is stabilized, um, there is bleeding. Uh. You also have a second group of emerging infections, or I would say infectious diseases, which were there all along, but we didn't know they were infectious. The classic example is peptic ulcer disease. When I was a resident and student, peptic ulcer was a case you sent to a surgeon. Mm. Because he would operate, he would do whatever those surgical resections of the stomach and this and that. Now we know it's an infection. Because we, now we identified helicobacter pylori. Mm. Same way there are so many other examples that I can tell you. Look at for example Lyme disease. Lyme disease was an enigma in, uh, in the US, of course we don't have it here. But till we identified Borrelia and we said, yes, Borrelia is an infectious disease that can present as Lyme disease as a clinical pattern. So this is your second group of emerging diseases which are there but they were not infections as decided as infections till few years ago till we knew. And we have a third category which I think you will be covering little later is organisms that have changed their behavior. Particularly either they are showing new types of symptoms or they are showing resistance to our usual treatment. So that's your emerging in you. So you can think of them in three categories. Entirely new ones, things that were there but we didn't know they were there. And of course organisms that are now changed to baffle us by producing different symptoms. And you see now the Omicron now is having sore throat and backache and not really affecting the lungs. So you can get new patterns of infection. So these are emerging infections. You could even call Omicron as an entirely new organism because it's presenting differently. Now coming little bit to the re-emerging infections. Now, when we say re-emerging infections, it talks about infections that you used to see in the past or you used to see in certain parts of the world but you are not seeing it here. So what has happened is that there has been a temporal and a geographical change mm -hmm. that certain diseases which did not occur in a particular <coughs> region or at a particular time are now occurring there. Look at dengue. Till 20 years ago or 30 years ago, dengue was unknown in mm -hmm. South America or in the Caribbean or in Central America. Now it's very important there. The reason for this, of course, is the fact that there is a change in the climate. We are talking about global warming. I can't forget that. I have a son-in-law who works for global warming, so I must always mention that. Global warming has changed the patterns of animal behavior, vectors, temperature, even the pathogens. We know that infections have seasonal variation depending on temperature, humidity, and so on. So I think that's one thing that's... And of course, the rapidity by which people transport infections. We all know the entity of airport malaria. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the reason why these infections have gone there, because the vectors have been transmitted, people are moving from here and there. It's no wonder why SARS-CoV-2 has now become a worldwide infection after starting from Wuhan. So I think that gives you the background, so I thought I'd just clarify that. Yes. Can I come back to your question? Okay, what are the indicators that this patient can be a victim of an emerging infection? Okay, I would like to go back to your previous slide, if you can just show that to me. I think the last the last two lines are very important. Visit to grandparents in Bhavnagar one week ago and few other similar cases seen in the neighborhood. This is the crux of the issue. When would you think of an emerging infection? You would think of when you see a sudden onset febrile illness. Of course, there has to be fever. Most of your infections come with fever. A sudden onset febrile illness in a previously well child. We know that if you are immunocompromised, yes, you can get any kind of infection. We don't call them as emerging infection. But if it's a healthy person and he has gone to an area where you know that there's some kind of a new infection or there are cases in the neighborhood that have not yet been identified, that's your starting point. So I think that's the answer to your question. You would think of it if you see a sudden acute febrile illness in a previously healthy person who probably traveled to a different region or he went to a forest or was playing with, came in contact with animals and there were other cases in the neighborhood. So then you should keep your ears up for that. Yeah. So the next question, in the same breath, I wanted to ask you is that when you think that this has come from some cluster, as a 
uh, treating team, what care should we take? Because it's only in COVID we realize that we are also important. Uh, until then, uh, I know there, there were situations where we have plunged ourselves uh, for the sake of our patient, but here is where we uh, have faltered in the past. So uh, a few words on that. Yes, you're right. We need to protect ourselves. Samir has told us just now. And we also know that a lot of physicians... And our team also, sir. It's a yes, team which is... Yeah, not hmm. the physician, the entire healthcare hmm. workers. And we know a lot of physicians and healthcare workers were victims during the first wave before we really knew what happened. But it becomes really difficult to say right from the first case that you should take precaution. Hmm. If I may quote Shakespeare, he said, one swallow does not a summer make. So. The very first case, I think it will be very difficult for anybody to say that, oh, this might be something, so I should st start wearing a full PPE. But this kind of scenario that you mentioned, where there have been cases in the neighborhood, there has been an outbreak, and we know that it might be a virus, and all the conditions that you mentioned are very, very infectious. The one you listed at the top, of course, not dengue, yeah. but CCHF and meningococcal meningitis. So you have to take precautions. And the precautions we all know by now, we've all done that for the last whole year. Exactly. It's masks, goggles, hand washing, gloves, a full PPE, and of course, great care while disrobing, while taking off your, so that you don't infect yourself. So that's what all the healthcare personnel need to do to protect yourself. Thank you, sir. So, so we stabilize the patient, we protect ourselves, we protect our team also. Uh, so my next question is to Dr. Anjali Shetty. What uh, kind of samples would uh, the treating doctor, the treating physician uh, like to collect uh, to aid into the investigation of the suspected case? And uh, also, where do we send these samples? If you could throw some light on that. Right. So now, like Dr. Suhas Prabhu said, to jump in and say this is Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever is a bit too premature. Though you're saying the patient is bleeding, is hemorrhaging from all sides, that is extremely worrying. But so you've got to send two sets of investigations. One is to diagnose something like CCHF. Another thing is a mic closer. Yeah, sure. Another thing is to rule out anything else. You know. So is it malaria? Is it dengue? What is it? Something common that your local lab can identify. A CBC. You need all of that to stabilize the patient too. So the basic fever workup. Correct. The basic patients. fever workup. So the important thing is to tell the lab that you're sending samples from a query patient of CCHF or an unknown infection which you don't know, you know. Right. So the person in the lab handles it in a biosafety cabinet, is wearing appropriate PPE, is not careless, doesn't have a needle stick injury, because this can easily kill a lab worker as well. Absolutely. And then that sample that is for CCHF will have to go to NIV Pune. And you okay. have to discuss it with them before you send it, you know, the transport, the packaging, and all of that has to be done properly. So there's no leakage on the way. No one else is put at risk. Correct. So clear communication with yeah. the laboratory where you would like yeah. to send and all the care. So thank you. That was actually our next question. Uh, so we are uh, trying to take care of a patient who seems to be uh, an infectious case of an acute febrile hemorrhagic fever. And CCHF could just be one of the differentials. And this is a, a child whom uh, we are going to have many of the medical fomites, there's going to be an esogastric tube, there's go there are going to be catheters, there are going to be IV uh, cannulas. So if you could uh, specifically uh, give us some uh, 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 ways to uh, manage those sure. medical vests, how to dispose them, how to take care of them. Sure. So ideally, all of this should go in a separate bag, you know, whatever you're getting out of that patient should be kept in a separate bag. The patient should be in a single room where there is a clear board put outside, do not enter without permission kind of thing, you know, so people are not going in and out of that room carelessly. And whoever is entering in is wearing appropriate PPE, like Sir said, they are not careless. It's very, very important because this sort of infection affects healthcare workers and healthcare workers are known to die if they don't take Absolutely. precautions, yeah. you know, much more than coronavirus. This is far more lethal, really. Okay. So we have to take care of all those things. And the most important thing is inform authorities like the BMC. Yeah. Right. When you see something like this, that would then the BMC takes over. Like, right. for example, our hospital was the first case to have a coronavirus infection in uh, in Mumbai. in the Mumbai. So when that happened, DMC was down the first night itself. They were there till 2 in the morning, you know, with that first case. Every corner of the hospital, they made us clean and they told us what to do. So you have to involve them early and right. they will take over from there. Right. So isolation of the patient when you suspect uh, a highly infectious case. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Sure. If it's a respiratory uh, infection, then we also need a negative pressure room if you Absolutely. can have that 
not just isolation, there should be, because most of our hospitals have a common air conditioning. Yeah. So unless you have a separate air conditioning with a vent outside, negative pressure, there is a risk. So you need a separate isolation room for this. Absolutely. Point well taken, sir. So um, to summarize, uh, you, have, you examine the patient, protect yourself and your staff, and collect the samples, as uh, Dr. Anjali has said, and inform the authorities. That's what's important here. So uh, with this, we go on to our case discussion. Um, the cases are real, all real cases. This case I'm talking about is a pre-COVID era case. And I will quickly go through the history and try to come uh, to the point that really is pertinent for us. A six-year-old child with fever for 10 days, cough, vomiting, maculopapular rash all over the body, irritability and drowsiness for three days is brought to us. This child has been seen by two pediatricians and treated with amoxicillin and anti-malarials. This is in pre-COVID era. There was no response to treatment. Remember, the child is having fever for 10 days. He is now sent to a higher center and on history, there is a history of a family trip to a forest resort a week before the symptoms appear. On examination, the temperature is 102 degrees, saturation is 94. Pulse, slightly tachycardia, tachypnea, BP is normal, puffiness of face and mild generalized edema. The rashes are all over, polymorphic, non-hemorrhagic and the eyes look normal. There is a liver of 3 cm and spleen of 4 cm. No significant findings in CVS or uh, RS but there is a little drowsiness on CNS, no joint involvement. Now, on the basis of these symptoms, um, I'm, I'll breeze through these because of lack of time. Uh, an acute encephalitic syndrome was thought of, dengue fever, scrub encephalopathy. If it were COVID era, we would have definitely thought of MISC. Cerebral malaria is something that we are supposed to think of in India for any child with fever and altered sensorium. The rash, however, goes against it. Coming to the investigations, the hemoglobin was 9.2. The total count was elevated, platelets were 1.24, mild transaminitis, I would not say mild, 660 and 480. The serum creatinine is 1.2, elevated, sodium is on the lower side, blood cultures, no growth, MP, dengue, negative and a scrub typhus IgM which was sent turned out positive. Now, sir, I, I wanted to ask you this question. I have breezed through the history, but whenever you want, I'll go back there if you uh, history and the examination. So, what are the clinical uh, features and epidemiological pointers to scrub typhus particularly? I think uh, if you look at the epidemiological pointers, they are there. This patient has been to the forest. Look at the incubation period. We know that scrub typhus has incubation about one week can be as early as two or three days, or as long as 14 days. But on average, it's a week. So if you see that timing is right, one week ago he was in the forest, then I would think of that. We know that scrub typhus is a zoonosis. It's transmitted by mites. <coughs> and it's one of the zoonosis, like, uh, I mean, I'm saying it's scrub typhus, but for all you know, it could be I, uh, Indian tick typhus too. They can look very similar to start with. Of course, you showed me the serology is positive, but without yes. that, we do know that it can happen. These are both Rickettsial group, although now our microbiologist friends have changed from Rickettsia to Orangia, mm -hmm. so it's a different uh, genus, but they are the basically same group of organisms. They are sort of in between bacteria and viruses. So to, they are all zoonoses, that means you have to have come in contact with animals or you have gone to the forest where you... So that is the background that is very, very crucial from the epidemiological point of view. Now coming to the clinical features, if you see a, a typhus case in the first few days, unless you are in a regular area where you see routinely cases, and I know we are in Thane, so we are calling it an emerging disease. If you are in Sholapur, you will not call it an emerging disease, something Correct. that you see yes. every day. Yeah. So if you are in Sholapur, I am sure they will have a much more, their antennas are up. But in Thane, it, we would not really think of that. In the first three or four days, it will be really very difficult to identify except going by the epidemiology. So that maybe should arise some suspicion, but Dr. Anjali will tell you also in the first four days they can't make a diagnosis. So I mean it doesn't really help. But what are the other clinical clues, if you can go back I can point them out to you. Okay, the one thing is uh, two this things. This is the history and the, the… history, yes. No, I want the physical examination. 
Okay, physical exam. One thing you will notice here is um, the puffiness of face, the edema of the hands with the rash. When you see edema with a rash, which is typically almost petechial, the diagnosis is a vasculitis. It's something that you see, for example, in non-infectious condition. You see HSP. In HSP, you get an elevated petechial rash. Of course, there's a particular distribution and all that. So when you see this kind of thing, you're thinking of a vasculitis mm -hmm. and typhus is the main pathology is actually an, a vasculitis because it damages the endothelium of the vessel. So that's what you will see there. The other thing that you will notice is the hepatosplenomegaly, which is very typical because it involves the reticular endothelial system. And if you go ahead to the, uh, sorry, yeah, to the investigations, you are seeing now the multi-system involvement. You are seeing the liver is involved, the kidney is involved, and the counts, look at the counts. The counts initially may be normal, even the platelet counts are normal initially, but I don't know what day of illness this is, but the platelets ten, tend ten, ten days. So it, after a week, the platelets tend to go down because of the clotting and the thing that happens in the, uh, in the vessels. So you see that little borderline low platelets, you see a uh, normal WBC count, you see liver involvement, you haven't written the albumin, but typically you also get hypoalbuminemia as a marker in typhus because there is a vascular leak. Hmm. So the albumin leaks out and the serum albumin typically goes low. So hypoalbuminemia is another important marker that you will see. And of course you have the negative thing here, you don't have a blood culture positive, you don't have MP and dengue positive and of course you have told me the scrub IgM is positive, it's positive because it's 10 days. But if this patient had come to me on the fourth day, I doubt whether we would have been able to make a, a diagnosis so easily. I know, I Suspicion, know. Suspicion, yes, but diagnosis, no. The hypoalbuminemia? Huh. The hypoalbuminemia is again expected in the second week onwards yes, second of the illness? Week. Okay. Second Thank week. Thank you. And uh, you said it is um, common in Satara and Sangli and those places. So uh, so, which are the areas uh, in Maharashtra in, which, where it is co okay, coming it's from? It's practically there all over Maharashtra. It's of course not there in the big cities because we don't come in contact with so animals or forest. Bombay is a concrete jungle. It's the only jungle you see is concrete jungle. So, you're not going to see forest here. But people who live in the rural areas, all over Maharashtra, you'll see it. If you want to talk about India, it's, it's seen all over India, mm -hmm. right up to the foothills of the Himalayas. You don't really see it in the Himalayan region, but up to the foothills of the Himalayas, you see lot of cases you see in Maharashtra, actually you have two pockets in Maharashtra and they are different organisms really speaking. About two thirds of the cases you see in India are scrub typhus and about one third are what you call ITT, Indian tick typhus. Mm -hmm. It's different, the Indian tick typhus is caused by Rickettsia conori and the scrub typhus is caused by Orangea tsutsugamashi, mm -hmm. it's also called tsutsugamashi fever. And the ITT is typically seen in the Khandesh region in Dhule, Jalgaon, that part of the country, whereas scrub typhus is more seen in the Sholapur, in the southern Sorry. district near the plains, beyond Satara and Sholapur. Okay, and so, uh, my next question was, in this patient, I'll show you how the uh, SCR was finally yes. discovered, but is the presence of SCR a must for the okay. diagnosis? Okay, let's define the SCR first. The SCR actually is an ulcerative lesion, which is often almost a centimeter in size or sometimes even longer, larger. It is the site where the mite has bitten the patient. And it's crazy because the mite is less than half a millimeter in size. But it causes a, an SCR. That's because it causes necrosis in the surrounding tissue because where the organism has entered the body. So you see a ulcerative lesion which is necrotic, dark, about up to 10 millimeters in size. Not 10 centimeters. Did I say centimeters? No, yeah, millimeter. Ten, one centimeter or 10 millimeters in size. Now, if you look at various reports, some will say the SCR is not very common. There are some reports which say only 7%. There are reports which say 90%. If you look at the, I can quote one report from Northeast India, which quotes a figure of 44%. Yeah. So roughly say at least about half the patients you can find the SCR, but you need to look for it. Now these are mites that actually crawl on the skin. They are not like mosquito bite that you will see on the exposed areas. Most of the SCRs you see are on the trunk, on the abdomen and often in the axilla or groin. That's the common sight you see. So unless you're careful to undress the child completely, you might miss the SCAR. So the point and if is the that patient you're seeing for the first time, hmm. you sometimes actually might see the mite on the clothes of the child, oh if you have, the child has come early to you. But you have to be really careful and look for it. So this but again, SCAR, since it's when only 50%, it come, I would After not say it's necessary to make a diagnosis. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, but once the mite bites, how long does the SGR per se form? How many days later? It takes a couple of days for it to form. So in the first two days, you will not see. It. see but this, yeah. this child has come to you at 10 days. 10 I mean, days. definitely <laughs> you would see the SGR if it was there. So biochemical investigations you've already mentioned and you've also said the hypoalbuminemia is one of the uh, pointers. Is there any other biochemical investigation that you would uh, point to? Biochemical, not really much. The, it's a multi-system disease, so, so you can't really make out much. But yes, you can do, for example, a CSF. This child you mentioned was a little drowsy. drowsy. Now, typically in, in typhus fevers, you get what is called as a meningoencephalitis. The meningitis component is not very severe. It's, mm -hmm. more, like an, it's more like a vascular encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. But, and therefore, you don't often get a true meningeal signs. Mm -hmm. But if you do get meningeal signs, or you have a seizure, or you have a severe altered sensory MR comatose patient, of course you're going to do a CSF. So that will give you biochemical information on the CSF. I don't think you've done it in this patient. No, no. But CSF often, particularly if you've done it, that means the patient has those kind of symptoms or signs. You will see elevated protein and often you see pleocytosis. Between 10 and 100 cells, most of the lymphocytes. That's what you will see in the biochemistry. So what are your views on the empiric use of doxycycline in such a situation? Suppose the scrub uh, IgM is taking time and uh, maybe if you were in Satara, you would have started. But what are your views in these patients where uh, awaiting investigations, people do tend to start doxy? I you know for a fact that if you are in Satara, the patient would have got doxycycline even before the before first blood test yeah. report has come. There are reasons for this and I can enumerate them to you. One is the fact that it's not easy to diagnose scrub type. Hmm. It's an organism that doesn't grow. You need to inoculate it in some guinea pig and whatever. Anjali can tell you more. You don't, it doesn't grow on the petri dish. So you can't really see. Serology comes positive after a week. You can do this PCR and molecular test, but they're not easily available. And I don't know how accurate they are. She will tell you more about it. The clinical picture I told you in the first few days is quite unremarkable. And the mortality in untreated patient is pretty high. On an average, I would say it's about 30% if you don't treat. If you, even if you treat, the mortality may be 5 to 7%. It depends on how severe the illness is, how late the patient has come to you, and the age of the child. The younger the child is, the worse is the prognosis. So taking all these factors into account, I think particularly if you are in Solapura, Satara, you see this kind of patient, I think I would go ahead and give him doxycycline as the drug of choice. Okay. So empirical treatment would be the norm. And uh, is it appropriate in younger children, uh, doxycycline? Ah, the issue about using tetracyclines using, in yeah, children. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I think a short, there is enough evidence now that a short course of uh, doxycycline, which you really need a very, very small dose, you just need 2.2 milligram per kg twice a day for a week. That's not a large amount that's going to cause damage to the child's bones or his teeth. So I think it's pretty safe, although we normally say tetracyclines avoid below the age of 7 or 8 years. I think this is a life-saving drug, so I would not hesitate to use it even in a younger age group. And the but other options of treatment, of the course? The other are options are either a macrolide or you can use chloramphenicol. Now, let me elaborate a little bit about this. I mean, it's quite simple, it's quite logical, and I think it's interesting, so I would like to mention it to you. Rickettsia don't have a cell wall. Because they don't have a cell wall, all your beta lactams are out. Mm -hmm. They're not going to work. You mentioned this patient that received amoxicillin. Yeah. Didn't work, not going to work because there's no cell wall. Secondly, rickettsia and orangia are intracellular pathogens. Mm. So your aminoglycosides are not going to work. They don't penetrate well intracellularly. So you need a drug that will go well intracellularly. It is inside the macrophages and the white cells of the immune system. And, the and therefore, macrolides are good drugs. And the best macrolide that penetrates intracellularly is azithromycin. So therefore, if you're using a macrolide, your second choice should be azithromycin if you don't want to use tetracycline. Coming to chloramphenicol, which is the third drug, it would, might be useful if you are not sure it's scrub typhus. Look at your differential diagnosis earlier. I won't ask you to scroll back. We said this might be meningococcal meningitis. If you are not sure and you want to cover both, chloramphenicol is a very good choice. It will, it has good CSF penetration. It's a good drug for meningococcus. It will also cover scrub type. So you have these three choices. There are other drugs we can use, but they're not really one I would recommend. Rifampicin works, but we like to reserve it for tuberculosis. Yeah. Even fluoroquinolones have some effect, <coughs> but again, we don't want to use them in children. So, uh, going forward, um, uh, question to Dr. Anjali Shetty. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Anjali, what are the diagnostic tests available uh, for the rickettsial fevers? 
and if you could also elaborate on which are the tests which we would specifically help us for early diagnosis, for example, when the illness is less than seven days or more. And uh, we will also talk about a little bit about the sensitivity and specificity. Sure. So the common, see there are gold standards, gold standards like immunofluorescence, which not every lab will do. But now, uh, less than seven days, you can consider doing a PCR. Now, this PCR is part of this multiplex panel. Most of your hospitals would possibly have a tropical fever panel, you know. We right. have one in our hospital, right. which diagnoses multiple things, like leptospirosis, uh, salmonella, pla uh, plasmodium, uh, and in dengue, chikungunya, and one of them is rickettsia as well. Right. So, it will pick up both the... Uh, both the types of rickettsia, rickettsia conori or uh, orentia will be picked up by that. So that can be done in the first seven days. But whether you see the patient that soon yes. is a big question. Like now. in this case, this patient has seen Correct. at uh, day 10 of illness. Correct. So in that case, it will not work. If it's, you know, beyond one week, your chances are not going to be good with PCR. Right. SCR PCR is meant to be much better than doing a blood PCR. Okay. Now, again, a regular lab will not do that. So, Vellore, CMC Vellore, they have a huge amount of experience with rickettsial illness. They see a lot of it. So, you can always talk to somebody there and send your samples. If you're ever stuck with a rickettsial illness, people in Vellore are good, you know, to speak to in terms of diagnosis. Okay. After that, beyond seven days, we have our usual serology. Like Sir said, it takes a week for it to come up. So, you yes. have your IgM. It is... How it's sensitive exactly, or specific It's not it is. that sensitive. When it, it is specific but not very sensitive. You know, you do miss a lot of cases with the IgM. So I've had clinicians call up and say, I can see an SCR, your test is negative, you know. So the test right. is not perfect. Okay. Also, wheel Felix, which is an age-old test that most yes. labs do, we are still doing that. So they detect OXK, OX9, antibodies to OXK, OX19 and uh, OX2. Now, OXK, antibodies to OXK indicate scrub typhus, whereas the Indian tick typhus, you get antibodies to OX19 and OX2. Two. What we do in the lab is we use Proteus, you know, mm. and the, uh, we're looking for antibodies to antigens of Proteus, because Proteus has the same antigens. It's a gram-negative organism, Proteus. Okay. So we're looking for antibodies to that. So as you can imagine, there's cross-reaction. Yes. So the specificity is said to be, you know, not that great. It's a non-specific test. Another issue is how much is, a, how, what tighter, at what tighter do you th say is it significant, you know, because right. you get one in 40, one in 80, one in 160. So one needs to know what is the background serological antibody level. So mm. usually they say if one in 160 is thought to be significant. But you know, when you speak to people, ID physicians who are constantly treating these infections, you realize that even a one in 40 in a patient whose picture is quite classical, they tend to end up treating it. With a strong it. clinical correlation. With a strong clinical yes. correlation. So all these antibody tests have to be taken, you know, with the clinical. In corroboration. Yeah, they're, the not, they're not perfect. None right. of the tests are perfect. All. And immunofluorescence is, again, something where you get the antigen all the way from, you know, uh, Australia, they make this antigen. Then you've got to put it on your slide, dry the slide, then put the serum on that, look for whether there is um, a, a glute, you know, like a... Uh, antigen a glute, and antibody yeah, An antigen-antibody yeah. reaction. Look at it under a fluorescent microscope. That is, I don't know if anybody does that, to be honest. Again, Velour would be the place to investigate for that sort of thing. It's said to be the gold standard. So actually, uh, believe it or not, we have only five minutes. <laughs> I wanted to add something yeah, about please. the Velfelix reactions. Because that still would be done in many places where this IgM ELISA is not available. I read somewhere that although the sensitivity is only 30%, a 1 in 80 titer is almost positive predictive value of 100%. Is that right, Dr. Anjali? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, unfortunately, for lack of time, we are just, uh, we wanted to discuss some MICs and all of that. So, I think we'll go straight to the last case, which is a case of uh, mucormycosis in a child who was brought to the casualty with diabetic ketoacidosis, uncontrolled diabetes, and uh, after stabilization, she developed this uh, swelling and loss of vision in her right eye. And uh, a CT was done, which showed the periobital swelling, bulbar stranding, which was suggestive of uh, orbital cellulitis. And MRI, which was done, uh, was 
suggestive of angio-invasive fungal infection. Now, this was only because the radiologists were sensitized to this kind of thing happening in the adults. So then they thought of mucormycosis. And um, uh, this child was treated for the same. So uh, we come straight to our discussion on this, is that, sir, I wanted to know from you, uh, is this one of those emerging uh, diseases post-COVID? Yes, because for some reason the SARS-CoV-2 virus seems to be interfering with your immunity. We have seen, for example, several patients come break out with herpes zoster for even children. Uh, two, three months I've had several cases. So whether it's the virus itself, plus on top of that we know that we give all these patients steroids. On top of that your patient is the diabetic mellitus. If you look at mucormycosis, typically it has been referred to as an opportunistic pathogen. Over 90 to 95 percent of patients are those who have some other immune deficiency, either they are immunodeficient by birth or they are on steroids or diabetes or now, like now we said, COVID who have received steroids. So yes, to that extent, it's an emerging infection or a re-emerging infection. This is what I would call it a re-emerging infection because we are not seeing so much of it, but you are seeing it now. Yeah. And uh, what are the comorbidities and uh, is prematurity uh, yes, a risk prematurity, factor? Said yes, prematurity. Yes. What are the red flags for suspicion? I'll, if, I'll just quickly go through the questions so you can talk about it. And why are the chances of having these infections in our country particularly higher? Okay. Red flag for suspicion are, of course, the high risk factors that we already mentioned, immunodeficient patient. We also need to see the site of the infection. The route of entry is through the nose. It's inhalation. So typically it's a orbital involvement, the nasal involvement, then from there to the brain. If you inhale it in the lungs, you can get a pneumonia. You also get cutaneous involvement and sometimes GI involvement. So the localization also tells you and the background. So that should be our red flags that will tell you that this is there. Of course, the color, everybody, is talking, everybody knows in the paper also the black fungus. Now the black is because of the necrosis. Because it's an angio-invasive, angio it causes infarction. So you get a black tissue. So that is, these are the clues for the red flags. Higher chance of this infection in our country, yes, any country where you have diabetes, we are supposed to be the diabetes capital of the world, and now we have SARS-CoV-2 in plenty, so yes, there is going to be increase possibly in these cases. But for some reason, we don't know, in the West they have not reported so much yes, mucormycosis right. even after COVID. So there have been two theories about this. One is about the use of steam inhalation. We don't know how That's important right. that is. The other is the use of zinc. Whether, and it was recommended that zinc to be given to patients with SARS-CoV-2. So whether zinc apparently helps the growth of the fungus? So the thing is that we, we have, no, no, we don't know really about the zinc and steam inhalation yet. The thing is that mucor, we always had much more than the West. So when in the West you don't see, even in the hematology population, you rarely see mucor. Mm -hmm. Whereas here you see it in all our diabetics, it's common in our uh, immunosuppressed uh, oncology. Factors? So we also environmental factors spores. considering the, our country. The spore count is much, much higher in our country. Correct. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Anjali Shetty, the next question to you, and any early investigation to pick up mucor? No, clinical suspicion number one, send the sample to microbiology and get a fluorescent stain done, a calcofluor right. fluorescent stain. Immediately you'll pick it up there, and because the culture positivity is, you know, less than 50% of this right. fungus. So, so smear. And that histopathology is, is very important. So, uh, briefly, COVID-associated mucormycosis, more common in COVID because of poor uh, cell-mediated immunity and cytokine strong. The risk factors are ventilation, prolonged stay, steroids, tocilizumab, voriconazole, diabetes mellitus, and poor hygiene. I think our country, um, that's what it is. Um, and because it's an angio-invasive disease, it can cause a, a lot of devastation in this child. A major surgery had to be done in order to save her. And uh, it's the third most common fungal infection. Case fatality rate is very high. And um, there are 47,000 cases of COVID-associated mucormycosis which were reported in our country. So what are the lessons we have learned today? It is imperative to be aware of emerging infections in our surroundings. There is a high index of suspicion that is needed for diagnosis. Actually, we were trying to talk about rational antibiotic use because one of our cases was a case of MDR, uh, Klebsiella in the NICU, but uh, for the want of time, for the want of time we had to check that. Really sorry. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'll, I'll take that, yes. You want to ask, sir?
iPhone at RIM, you will see in a lot of septic conditions, so I would not say it's very characteristic. You see, for example, in NSTI, you see it in gram-negative sepsis. So I would, I would think hypoalbuminemia would be more important in this, along with the multi-system involvement. Yes, it is there. But it is there in NSTI, it is there in gram-negative sepsis, it is there in so many. So it is not unique for typhus. Right. So, um, isolation of the patient and protection of the healthcare personnel who is caring for the patient has to be prioritized. Appropriate samples to be collected, dispatched or preserved with due care. Epidemiological history is very, very important apart from the clinical history and also contact tracing in case of a high index of suspicion. Awareness and meticulous infection control policies, practices in our ICUs and in our nursing home will help uh, spread uh, prevent the spread of uh, deadly and resistant bugs. And lastly, Dr. Suhas Prabhu, I would like you to have a word on uh, the rational use of antibiotics in this case. Please. I know we missed that because the second case was about a multidrug resistant yes. bacterial infection. I wish we that. could take that, <coughs> but for the want of time, we'll have to skip that. Okay, I think, uh, I mean, we are all there. What is there to say? I've been saying it for last 10 years now. We have to be rational in how we use antibiotics. I have this story, Dr. Vasan Nagvekar, he's actually an adult physician who works at Global and Leelawati. He told me that patients who get transferred into their ICU, 24% of them on admission are CRE resistant, that is carbapenem resistant. So what is the problem? The problem is not really in the ICU. I think that because the patient gets routine antibiotics unnecessarily used for viral infection, so he develops a first level of resistance. By the time he comes to get admitted to the hospital, he has to be on something like peptides or some fluorohyde, fluoroquinolone. So by that time he comes to the ICU, he's multidrug resistant. <clears throat> so I don't think there's any point in trying to tell the intensive care people, and I know many of them are here, people are dealing with leukemics, people are dealing, they will do, the, they will overuse antibiotics, that's accepted. We who are at the periphery doing outpatient practice, and that includes non-pediatricians too, have to be very, very judicious. If we don't use antibiotics, they are first line. And we, I know people don't even use first line. You use cefpodoxam and linezolid for URTI. That's terrible. So, also so I think that, that the message is don't use an antibiotic unless you are sure there's a bacterial infection. Use the standard recommendation, the first line drugs. There's no need to jump to the second line. Keep that reserved for your ICU. Then your intensive care patient will respond to carbapenems. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So um, lessons from, take home messages from this session, basically for any emerging uh, infection, we need to be uh, on our toes to suspect an uh, acute uh, febrile illness when we encounter one or any undifferentiated illness. Also, uh, the care for self, that is the healthcare person and the team, uh, isolation, taking care of the samples, uh, taking care of uh, uh, the spread of the illness and the antibiotic stewardship. Uh, we would, uh, me and Dr. Arshana, we would uh, recommend the audience to uh, have a look at this movie, Virus, it's which is about. It's not on the screen anymore. It's a <laughs> yeah. So it's a movie called Virus, which is about uh, the infectious illnesses, emerging in, in infections. And with that, we thank our uh, panelists, Dr. Suhas Prabhu, sir. Thank you so much for being here with us. And also, Dr. Anjali Shetty. Thank you so much. Thank you. May I request Dr. Amruta Durge to felicitate Dr. Anjali Shetty, ma'am? May I request you, sir, to be on the stage, please?